Hi, I'm Nick Allred. I'm an MST student in English Literature, 1700 to 1830 at Balliol College, Oxford, and the work I'm talking about today has been made possible through the Balliol Bodley Scholarship. So I've been working in special collections with the help of Alexandra Franklin um, on a curious little scrapbook from the Harding Collection. And the Harding Collection has a great deal of printed ephemera, ballads for the most part, and this is a scrapbook of ballads um, completed, it seems, in the early 19th century, around 1805, by a young woman, uh, Mary Marshall, and uh, it draws on material, uh, both clipped uh, printed ballads and manuscript transcriptions of ballads from, it seems, roughly 1795 onward. And it, it seems to be the collection of this particular girl, Mary Marshall, um, but one that she shared with a friend of hers whose note of encouragement is included uh, later on and around the middle of the book. So um, a lot of the ballads that have gotten the most attention have been the broadside ballads. These are ballads that are printed on a single sheet, like this one, this first one in the collection, Banks of the D. Um, they often come with rather ornate uh, illustrations. Um, and uh, Mary seems to have collected some of those, perhaps a half dozen. And those she'll put on a single page on the recto side. But this is far from the only sort that she collected. Um, and I think that there are also some that may be broadsides, but where the illustration is clipped and then they're put onto, you know, often a verso side, but the illustration is clipped out and instead of the illustration, she has pasted in more smaller clippings from smaller format printings of ballads, often chapbooks, which are very short, little pamphlet style collections of songs, often about a dozen. Now, it's difficult to identify her sources because of these 77 songs that she has in here, um, many of them, almost all of them really, appear in multiple formats in multiple places. And even in a collection as extensive as the Harding and broader, all the Bodley and Holdings, it's still a drop in the bucket compared to the volume of ballad publication that went on throughout the 18th and 19th century. It was an extremely popular form of popular culture. And they're very difficult to trace, especially non-broadsides, um, because all you know is that you're looking at a collection of chapbooks, basically, when you pull up something from Harding. Um, you can sometimes you can get the titles of the individual chapbooks that are bound together in a certain collection, and you know that might give you some indication of what you're looking at, but it's very difficult to trace an individual song. And once you've found a song, it's impossible to know whether the typography is going to line up, whether the format's going to line up, and thus whether we can say with authority whether or not she's clipped from a particular location. So what I've done to try and identify her sources has been just to immerse myself in the chapbook collections of the Bodleian, and I have managed to identify two sources that we can be very, very confident that she clipped these songs from. The numberings, the formats, the typography all line up, um, as do the years of publication. Those sources are a chapbook called The Lady's Evening Companion, uh, published by Pitts in London, and a chapbook called Lord Nelson's uh, Brave Nelson's Garland, uh, published, I believe, by Evans in London. Um, from the first, from the Ladies' Evening Companion, she drew five songs, and from Brave Nelson's Garland, she clipped to and may have transcribed another, The Genius of Britain, um, where she wrote it out in manuscript because, incidentally, it seems to have been on the reverse side of one of the ones that she clipped, and so she couldn't you know, clip both of them. And the spellings line up, the placement in the scrapbook lines up, it seems like that's where she 
wrote out that manuscript from. For the other ones that she wrote out in manuscript, which are mainly in the latter half of the scrapbook, book, it's really impossible to say where she drew them from, but all of them seem to be songs that were in heavy circulation at the time in chapbooks and other collections. So there's an enormous temptation with something like this to say as much as we can Know, even sheer conjecture about the person who put it together because it seems to be so private and so intimate a thing. And she indeed seems to be that sort of collector, that sort of curator. She doesn't clip everything that comes into her hands. One of the wonderful things about working with the entire reserves of the Bodley and all of the collections of chapbooks that the Bodleian has has been that gotten a sense of what sorts of subgenres, what sorts of themes, what sorts of things tend to run through uh, collections of chapbooks and ballads that turn up again and again. Some of those themes and um, you know, particular favorites occur here. There's a lot of ballads about suffering, especially young girls, but also young men, um, unlucky in love, Especially some of the naval songs you know, include girls on shore waiting for their lovers and faithful tars pining for their girls on shore. Um, she's very, very into those. But there are other genres that she avoids entirely. They're conspicuously absent. Hunting songs. There are a lot of hunting songs at the time in a lot of these chapbooks. There are no hunting songs in Harding B-41 drinking songs. I don't believe there are any drinking songs in B-41, and there were a lot of drinking songs, you know, not only one can imagine sung, but also published in these chapbooks. And so, indeed, in, oddly enough, in Ladies' Evening Companion, there is a song called Love and Whiskey, um, and that's one of the ones that, even though it was intact and on a single page in that chapbook, right for the clip, right for the clipping, she didn't clip it out and didn't paste it in here. I think that avoidance of hunting songs and drinking songs does probably line up with the, what we can imagine were, was the cultural role of a young girl at the turn of the 19th century. And the note that her friend wrote to her said that she had showed very good taste. And one can imagine the friend wouldn't have written that if she had included hunting and drinking songs. She also doesn't include many parodic or satirical songs. Um, there are some silly songs in here, but very few that sort of have a nasty edge to them, very few that are controversially topical or political. There are some topical or political songs in that they are rather patriotic, pro-Britain, and there is one song, The Genius of Britain, which is the one transcribed in manuscript from the chapbook that I mentioned earlier, that looks sort of approvingly on a British mutiny. But it's very much cast in patriotic terms. And other than that, there are very few on, say, pressing political issues at the time. For instance, I recently ran into a song about the dog tax in a chapbook, and that's not something that she clipped or found interesting. Um, she steers away from parodic and satirical songs, too, in that she doesn't include answers, responses, parodies of other songs, which was also a tremendous genre in the chapbook industry. The closest thing that she has to one of these responses or satires or parodies is a set of paired songs, The Fashionable Wife and The Fashionable Husband. However, she doesn't include you know, other than that, and those seem to be published together because they're typographically identical, she doesn't include any answers, responses, or anything like that, which was a very common genre at the time. I, that also might have something to do with her shying away from the bawdier ballads, because often these answers or responses take a satirical and a bawdy turn and, you know, often are satirizing the faithful lover by suggesting that you know, it's not love but lust. And she seems to uh, favor love over lust repeatedly um, in this scrapbook and in this collection. Its relation to its era, 
this scrapbook's relation to its era is particularly interesting. It's the Romantic era, right? And the common thread throughout this is tremendous romanticism. She's got a predilection for pastoral scenes. All of the illustrations are pastoral. Most of the romantic ballads are pastoral. Pastoral and naval scenes. She's very into wide open spaces, it seems. So I recall uh, J. Paul Hunter's argument that the novel's role in early 18th century culture was in some ways a literal compensation, a spatial compensation for the compressed, compact nature of urban life and a recalling of the open spaces that had been lost. And I think her predilection for pastoral scenes and for the wide open ocean might have something to do with that. But yes, again, there's also a tremendous romantic thread running through this collection. Both the romance of uh, sighing maidens and these uh, pastoral love stories and songs, and also the romance of the ocean. Either the patriotic romance, there are some martial songs, some very pro-Britain songs, um, and also the romance of the sailors leaving behind their beloveds and staying faithful. One of the most maudlin titles in the collection that you know, never ceases to make me chuckle and probably go into hell is she, drop, she Dropped a Tear and Cried Be True. Um, and it's tempting because a lot of these naval songs and a lot of these especially romantic girl on shore songs come later on in the collection, it's tempting to read the scrapbook chronologically, as it were. And there's also circumstantial arguments for that, in that it seems to be finished, that certainly the final date on it is 1800, and that looks to be a three or a five. And there are songs from 1796 and quite possibly earlier um, in the collection. So it certainly was a project of years and years. But I don't think we can map that chronology onto the page sequence. I, tempting as it is, it appears to be thematic, but not thematic in a sort of coming of age way. I don't think that we can biographically say that halfway through the scrapbook, you know, her lover went off into the Navy, and so that's why she becomes obsessed with these naval songs of girls left on shore. I think that she's organizing it thematically throughout. And I think we have to say that because once I identified those two sources, I found that the songs she clipped from them appeared on different pages in the scrapbook. So it does seem that she'll take one source and then arrange different songs from it thematically over these pages. And there appears to be a thematic unity in a number of the pages. In, not just in the fact the first half is very pastoral and the latter half very martial, but there are also particularly martial pages or particularly romantic pages. Um, or particularly silly or insouciant pages. And so I think that we're best off understanding her as a collector, a collector of the songs, the ballads that spoke to her and that she identified with. We can identify her as a typical ballad consumer, but not the only typical ballad consumer because there are subgenres that she shows a tremendous predilection for and others that she avoids entirely. And we should understand her as a curator and one who's arranging these ballads in ways that make sense to her. And understanding the way in which a consumer and curator of ballads interacted with, understood them, um, and did seem to draw links among their content and to choose some and pass others over just yields tremendous promise in the exploration of what truly was a massive form of popular culture.